Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Tanya Kimball, Senior Communications Manager at Citiva. For the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be talking about the Innovation Accelerator, Citiva's internal seed funding program, which we created to source and scale in-house innovation. Joining me today are four fantastic guests who will bring diverse perspectives on the Accelerator's first challenge, Planet Business. Joining us virtually from outside Heidelberg, Germany is Dirk Vogel, C Citiva's VP of Innovation. We've got Maria Curry serving as Citiva's CFO and joins us today from the Boston area. Hi, Maria. Renee Bach joins us from Copenhagen, Denmark, and is a principal at Implement Consulting Group. And finally, we have Roger Norberg joining us from Uppsala, Sweden. Roger is a senior project manager at Citiva and a member of Team Dreamstream, one of six teams to receive nearly $4 million in seed funding as part of Planet Business. So throughout the broadcast, if you have any questions for any of our participants, feel free to put them in the chat and we will try and answer as many as possible. So let's get started at the beginning. And Dirk, why don't you tell us how Innovation Accelerator came about? Yes, yeah, sure. So Tanya, first of all, innovation is one of the key values for Sativa. So it's not a surprise that we are focusing on innovation. And we've been on a journey for the last, I would say, eight years or so, learning different ways. But if I were to summarize, I think there are like three key things that we learned along the way that we're implementing in the Innovation Accelerator. Number one is start with the people, the innovators, people that have ideas. And I really don't mind where in the organization people are. Everyone is supposed to uh, have new ideas and get a chance to pitch those and actually show those and demonstrate that to senior leaders so they can have a chance to get their ideas implemented. So first, work with the passion of the people that we have. Second thing is ideas on anything. It doesn't have to be always a new product, right? Sometimes it's the process. Sometimes it's the way we talk to a customer. Sometimes it's the way how we use technology. How, sometimes we offer a new service. So there are so many different ways to be innovative and to have transformational approaches to, the, to our Citiva and to our customers. And third, really important, make it relevant. Outcome is much more important than output. So it's not about realizing an idea, but it's what do we do with that idea? So in this case, we had the, uh, for, for our first innovation accelerator, we had this theme, grow the business while we're saving the planet. So that is super important that it's relevant for the business and sustainability was one of the, or is one of the key themes for Cytiva, but it was really started last year. So, um, and with this theme, we brought six projects to life that were three of them already scaling and deliver tremendous value to the organization and to our customers and to the environment. Um, so yep, yeah, that's how it got started. And those are the three key points that I wanted to bring across. That's great. So is that what helped you? So th this is a really large investment, right? So um, how did you go about pitching that to Maria and other senior leaders that it would be a worthy investment? To be honest, uh, Tanya, it, it, it was hardly any pitching needed because Emmanuel and Maria, they were pulling. They were pulling and, and actually challenging me and saying, how can we get transformational ideas to grow and, and really accelerate? We're a very good organization about doing our innovation, and it's very often very much incremental ideas, and, and but we have brilliant ideas that are more unorthodox. And how do we accelerate those? How do we bring those to life? And, and how do we help those teams who have those ideas? And that's how the Innovation Accelerator was born, that we empower these teams, give them a voice, and educate them how they should actually talk to senior managers, how they make their ideas heard and relevant for the business. And um, that's what we did and, and through this, uh, for these six projects. That's great. Maria, I'd love to hear um, from you about how, you and the other senior leaderships, um, why you thought to invest from your perspective. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tanya. Uh, one of the critical points uh, and focused areas on how we decided to invest on what we decided to invest was uh, following the key principle of, is this aligned to our strategic imperatives? Um, does it really uh, uh, follow 
the key uh, strat plan uh, guidelines that we have set for the business. Um, and does it get us closer to solve and answer some of those uh, critical questions that are at the forefront of our industry and our customers today? Um, so following those two principles, um, you know, it was quite easy for us to determine where we invest, what we invest on, and how we continue to propel our innovators to, to stay focused on truly, you know, what matters. It's not all about return, but it's about are we solving the critical questions that our customers are asking us to address. Um, sustainability was one that, you know, it's at the forefront of our strategic imperatives as a company and a problem we all are focused to solve for, not just for the short term, but for the long term. So long term thinking was a, a key proponent as well of how we think about innovation uh, for the company. So what were your concerns going into this and so, how did Dirk address them? Yeah, some of the concerns were, are we long term focused? Uh, was was a, a key one. Uh, do we have what we need in terms of the resourcing? Is the team equipped to succeed? Are we, you know, giving them the freedom for them to operate? It's not just the budget, but the time and the space uh, for them to 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 think through, uh, collaborate, uh, cross-functionally work and develop you know, from an idea to concept to business case and and execute on it. That's great. Wonderful. Uh, Renee, is this the type of initiative you've helped initiate at other companies? Yeah, so, so Tanya, first of all, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, we have done similar projects uh, before, but I guess this one was a little bit different, actually. First of all, we were basically met by like-minded people in our first conversations with uh, Dirk, Paul, and Simon. And it was pretty evident that we kind of shared the same language around uh, innovation. And all our conversations were basically about sort of the nerdery and the passion for corporate entrepreneurship, um, but also the aspiration. I mean... Uh, plan a business as a theme touches upon some of the or one of the biggest worthwhile problems that every company these days need to glue themselves onto and are kind of looking for answers for and um and i mean teeing it up as a company-wide challenge and basically invite everyone in to uh, to participate was something that 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 was super inspiring to us and I'm, i honestly believe that sativa is maybe one of the most uh, innovation savvy organizations that we have uh, ever worked with you you really kind of act out the test and learn mindset without collapsing in innovation theater and i i don't think you can take that for granted so dirk what made you decide to bring in implement in the first place yeah uh, tanya i mean i think uh, renee already indicated we were extremely well aligned so uh, we are learning organizations so one of the things uh, i mentioned our learning journey was also that we wanted to learn from how other companies did it right uh, other companies have done similar programs but obviously we wanted to take the best out of what we knew and what uh, the industry is doing and uh, implement really stuck out as they fully aligned on our philosophy. I mean, we have test and learn is the key element of what we do. So we want the teams to create evidence through early testing with customers. But at the same time, we want them to think big, but start small, right? A high risk idea to de-risk it, but at the minimum investment in the beginning. And then when you validate it, then you can grow the investment. And I think that was something that um, we were 100% aligned with, with Implement and uh, a fantastic team to work with. And they brought so much spirit and new tools to us. So it was a pleasure to work with them. That's great. So Renee, going into this, what made you and your company feel you could deliver on Dirk's vision? Um, good question. Uh, I, I would love to, to hear Dirk's uh, answer to that. but. I mean, we had experience with running virtual accelerators before, and I mean, in, in Corona times, this was at the very beginning of the of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I think our experience benefited the process. Um, 
and also because we shared the same language. I mean, we could hit the ground running and, and really deliver value from day one. And uh, and then, I mean, we are builders, right? We, we like to get our hands dirty and uh, immerse ourselves into the issues that the team will experience. And I think that uh, that made a difference. Great. And so going into this, what were some of the challenges that you anticipated? Yeah, I, could, I mean, I could probably mention a few, uh, okay. but but, uh, but there is maybe one thing that I would like to highlight, and it doesn't necessarily kind of, uh, count for Sativa only. I think that it's close to universal and seen in many, many organizations. And, and maybe the easiest way I can kind of talk about it is by sharing a small story from a meeting uh, with a with a quite famous uh, guy called Craig Christensen. He was kind of a, the founding father of disruptive innovation. And in that meeting, he said something that's kind of stuck with me ever since. And he said, you know, it's funny because big companies, they, they tend to see big opportunities and small companies, they tend to see small opportunities. But we all know that every big idea uh, started small somehow. And it actually counts for funding as well. So you have to sort of dream big and you have to start small, but you actually also have to to uh, uh, invest small. And I think it's hard to crack for, for most organizations because it almost feels counterintuitive or unambitious to not back up at a big idea with, with a big investment. But this is actually what you have to change. You have to sort of chop up the investment and make sure that you only fund uh, progress as you go along. And I think that was one of the things that at least uh, we had some interesting conversations around. Yeah, oh, interesting. Um, so it looks like we have an audience question from for Dirk. So we will get to that. So this is exciting. This is our first question. Um, this is from Alexandria. She asks, I understand this is an internal seeding program. Is Cytiva planning on setting up innovation challenges with external actors? Ooh, that's a good question, Andrea. Uh, uh, so, Alexandria. <laughs> Alexandra, that's a great question. And not only are we planning it, we're actually doing it right now. So we have actually run two external challenges, which uh, we can go into probably in, a, in an upcoming uh, broadcast and much more in detail. So we did one on digital solutions and we did one very specifically on exosomes, which like areas where um, we wanted to learn about. So I think that's, um, it's maybe not a seeding program to start a new startup, but it's certainly an uh, innovation program where we collaborate externally. And I can tell you there are lots more in the pipeline that we're thinking about. Yes, so it's a great question. Thank you. Great. Um, so Dirk, let's continue with you for a second. I am fairly new to Cytiva, so I am inspired by the company's focus on knowing the positive or and the negative impact of our operations. It seems to be an ethos felt and lived both from the top down and the bottom up. So how did Cytiva's culture impact this first innovation accelerator? Yeah, Tanya, you're absolutely right. Um, it needs to come top down. So uh, the, the support that we got from Maria and Emmanuel was absolutely fantastic, starting with the with the communication, uh, like allowing us to work on a strategic imperative and, and obviously sustainability and, and business growth are core. Um, and the support also all the way through. I mean, these programs have been now running for 12 months, right? And giving people far down in the organization and, and different layers uh, the ability to talk to a CEO or the CFO once a quarter on, on their ideas and the progress of the project has been just amazing. Um, but on the other hand side, our, our people, the, the associates at Sativa are, are, are passionate and, and there very many of them are uh, passionate about sustainability. And that combined with a can-do uh, culture, we really tapped into this passion of, of the people. And uh, I mean, Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So you, you have to have a good strategy, of course, but if your associates don't nurture and live the strategy, you cannot be successful. So it's really important to bring those two things together. And um, that's what we did through the program. Great. I would love to hear uh, Maria and Roger's perspective on how the culture, your perspective on how the culture influenced the program yeah so let me start with um you know it for me the program was one where i saw a global talent working together a, a first and foremost we had a you know team members that expanded from new zealand sweden the us 
you, you know, other parts of the world collaborating to create and co-create uh, these ideas, um, giving different perspectives uh, or, and with the expertise, um, we had scientists, you know, operators, um, distributors, all co cooperating and giving also their part. As you can imagine, some of these ideas expand on a workflow that touch you know, from the moment that you, you are discovering, um, finding the raw, the raw material, creating a complex formula and applying it. So for me, the beauty of that was seeing this collaboration on a cross-cultural, cross-functional um, to generate what I would say a best outcome, right? Or a desired outcome. So that to me was inspiring. The second part, you know, not being a scientist, was you know, the opportunity to listen uh, to these ideas, to learn and to see them applied to real life problems, right? We, we all can recognize what a real life problem is, but in seeing how different uh, in, you know, backgrounds come together to solve for it uh, and having the opportunity uh, as a non-scientist to observe uh, and to participate through that process was truly a, a, a learning opportunity for me. So, you know, I, I do think is um, when when uh, people come together towards a best outcome, you can truly, truly see the ability to create a, 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 and come with a, something forward. A, one, one item that I believe was a secret to the success was to let the teams innovate a, a, on their own. So they, they set, you know, truly the parameters uh, uh, for this. They proposed uh, and came up with the business plan. Um, and that ability to operate with freedom is one of the areas that I truly think that was the secret for success. Great. Great. And I'd love, Roger, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well on the culture impacting this. Yeah, I, I think with the culture, making it personal, it feels very uh, energizing for me. And also if you consider that we see that the, the end customer, the patient, and if you replace that with the name of someone near and there, at least for me, then it feels very easy to get energy and motivation and, and drive an ID towards finalization. So I think this make it personal culture and, and then take responsibility for your, your idea and to get the possibility for that is uh, amazing and it's very encouraging. That's great. And Renee, as an outsider, um, I would love to know how Cytiva's approach compared to other clients you've worked with. Um, you know, are we the same? Were, were we different? I'm curious. I actually think you're different in a way that you 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 honestly you acted out you walked the talk instead of you know planning and planning. Um, I mean, you teed up as as a challenge where you, as I said before, you you invite everyone in um, to contribute. And I think that is actually different. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, turning it into a bottom up movement uh, rather than a top down exercise only. Uh, is something that I that I that I admire a lot, and I think that you know it's kind of saying you know hey sustainability is actually part of everyone's job. It's not something that a selected few at the very top of the organization should do, and then cascade it into the organization. So I think in that sense, it's uh, it's actually very different, and it's not only about innovating products and services or new businesses. It's actually also about innovating sort of the leadership and engagement model around it. Great. So there's a, a couple of things for the audience members that I, I want to share with you. So one, um, Cytiva is really into sustainability. It's one of our imperatives. So if you'd like to learn more about it, you can go to www.citiva.com slash sustainability. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share, you've heard um, a lot of people talking about make it personal, make it better. And that is something that our CEO reminds us of often he's you know there's always a patient behind everything we do a person you know so um we always try and make it personal make it better it's just who we are so um to get back to the innovation accelerator we've got so here, dirk we've got the green light we've got the funding and you're ready to launch so 
how do you go about soliciting ideas from associates? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a challenge, right? And uh, as I said, we started top down. So if the CEO of the company tells everyone to be the CEO of their own idea, um, well, that, that's a message. But uh, in order to get everyone energized and get everyone in the organization to really put on the thinking cap and, and start to not only think about it, but do something, was uh, required some activation. And we did this by reaching out, obviously working with the comms department, but uh, also <laughs> by reaching out uh, to the individuals as much as we could. So we, we spent time going to town halls, uh, spent time going to team meetings. We actually um, came up with this idea of using catalysts. So people that we work with in innovation that have been engaged, actually, we asked them to take uh, the message and carry it out in their region, in their commercial organization, in their function. So um, that was one way how we could reach everyone and get everyone to hear the message. We want your idea to show up here. And I mean, it did work. We reached, uh, so we had about 20% of the organization. So over 2000 contributions um, of in our on our website and and ultimately leading to 124 submissions on the website. So um, it worked. We reached the people, and that was amazing to see. That's an amazing response. So were you were you surprised? I, I would say humbled is probably the better term. I mean, we get so many great ideas that it, it was really hard to uh, to pick the best six. So. Um, but it was amazing to get to see that resonance and feedback and trust. I mean, it's it's people are trusting their idea to the company and to us, and and um, having I mean being humble enough to pick that up and actually tr treat it with trust, right? I think it's it's super important. That's great. Um, I'd love to hear from Roger. Uh, what made motivated you to join the challenge? So we had already started to discuss how we could use remote demos for supporting our customers. And then the pandemic came and that resulted in that we shifted to remote FAT to ensure that we had uninterrupted supply of equipment to our customers. So also the challenge as an opportunity to get support for developing, refining and, and spreading this idea, this concept to other sites and uh, in parallel, it was a colleague that encouraged me to say, well, Roger, I think this is a good idea. You should submit it, which convinced me. So I did that with a broader focus. That, that's great. Uh, so when you, okay, you decided to, to submit, which was wonderful because here you yeah. are. But uh, what was that process like leading up to that? So there were several reasons for us starting with the remote demo concept, considering that we could save time, money, and also reduce the environmental impact by not shipping large and heavy equipment back and forth to customers, or that the customers need to fly to our sites to participate in a demo. Uh, usually when we have demos at customer site, we need to fly people there. And with the, re the remote demo concept, we could do more demos because we don't have the equipment in transit between us and the customer. And then the pandemic uh, started and prevented travel and to secure our staff, we couldn't accept that the customer come to our site to do their FAT. So then why not use the demo concept on FAT? So we contacted an external supplier that helped us to specify a technical solution that turned out to be a mobile TV studio. And further, we also saw that the travel restrictions will have an effect on both trainings, audits, and other type of event. So we saw that, okay, we bundle these type of use cases and so that the common denominator is saving time, money, and reduced environmental impact. And since the challenge was about sustainability, it fitted well, I felt. Great. Um, that's wonderful. Oh, and it looks like we have two more questions coming in, um, which is great. We've got one question for Dirk, so we'll start with that. Let's see what the question is. Oh, or from... Rodrigo, we say hello. Oh, for both of them, actually. Um, hello, Dirk and Maria. This program has been a great way to boost some innovative 
projects, but it required team members to dedicate themselves almost 100% to their projects. This indirectly sends the message that to innovate, we need to drastically alter our day to day. Could we find ways to make innovation part of our everyday work? Ooh, that is excellent. Excellent no, question. No. I mean, actually, part, so I should answer that maybe in two or three different ways. Number one is, um, yes, these. The, the people who are on the program, some of them decided to actually do this full time, um, but it wasn't full time during the boot camp. So we had we had the selection phase we talked about. We're going to talk a little bit more about the boot camp. Um, that's not full time. But afterwards, we actually gave the opportunity, and Maria provided that funding for some people actually to say, "Okay, let's find someone who can replace me in my day job, uh, while I'll focus 100% on on this project going forward." And and some actually some people took this learning that they had through the, throughout the process also to say, you know what I feel so passionate about this I want to take a new job. There was a new job created for sustainability in in a, in a, and a role in the business and they applied for it and they got that role. So um, yes, there are some people who really change it 100 percent, but. Uh, at the same time, and what we're doing is with these um, six teams that we take through the innovation bootcamp, or actually uh, uh, this year we take, took 10 teams through this, we are actually educating the organization and the people in the organization to say, what does it take to bring an innovation to life? And, and the rules, what we do there, are applicable to everyday work as well. So you can do that um, as part of your day job as well, the, the principles are the same. So you don't have to take on a new job. It can be part of your daily job. So um, that's part of what we do. It's it's really innovation for everyone all the time. However, for the acceleration, we really put focus on a few programs and really move them at a much higher speed that we could otherwise do. And uh, that's the philosophy here. Um, Rodrigo, I hope this answers your question. Great question. Um, we have another one. So I'm going to let Maria take this one and it should be showing up in a moment oh, from Jaron. I hope I'm saying that right. So forgive me if I'm not. Um, innovation is inherently risky and getting the most from a portfolio of innovation initiatives is more about managing risk. What are some of the approaches to figuring out when to kill something? Is financial outcome one of the cre key criteria? Good question. Yeah. Uh, well, let me start with that, and then I will touch on the prior uh, question as well. But um, so, in terms of risk, you know, uh, we we follow actually to you know a, a criteria and even the DBS methodology when making our decision here. The first one was impact, and you know, really a difficulty or ease. To, to to implement, to follow through the innovation, right? Uh, that's a very simple matrix that you can apply on anything you do in life. Is this a high impact uh, to solve or address that critical problem to get us closer to our strategic goal? And then the difficulty uh, or the ease to, to reach that conclusion. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of risk, uh, and you know our ability to kill or to continue to fund a, a, an idea is in two folds. Uh, we have followed the feedback that our teams on the ground are giving us as they have come and presented, uh, you know, their their discoveries and their ideas in regards to you know the impact that we see is much greater than what we initially uh, assess in the business plan or lower and the difficulty uh, is greater or lower. So we have, you know, uh, listened to them. Uh, in the process have been, uh, what I would say, uh, ever evolving, as you know, innovation evolves constantly. And what we have seen is a lot of flexibility and, and agility as the teams have gone through the process um, of uh, understanding the impact and the risk. Yes, we have killed many ideas, uh, in some cases, fast, uh, because failing is part of learning. In other, in other cases, uh, 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 over a longer period of time, when we have seen that the desired outcome, not just from a financial perspective, but from a technological perspective, it is not the one that we were expecting. Now, I'd like to touch on the prior point and question in regards about how can we innovate 
on our on our, on our everyday life. And you know, I do think that the best thinking actually happens when you're not thinking about it. Uh, when you allow your back brain to you know take a, a, the, 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 the first space on what you do, uh, when you are not uh, busy uh, actively you know operating or doing um, tasks and work. So that ability to let your back brain come uh, and have uh, the freedom to think is one that, that I think allows anybody, uh, all of us, to, to innovate, to, to bring our best thinking forward on everything we do every day. That's great. Um, I'm also curious to hear about the boot camp. So I would love to hear first from Dirk and Renee about how, how did you go about setting it up? What was involved? What were you expecting out of people? What did you want to get? What did you want them to get out of it? Yeah, so um, so first of all, I mean, we look at the, uh, out of, we had to select six ideas, right, out of the 124. So, um, but those ideas weren't lost. I mean, you can say the question previously was, what, how do we stop? Um, we looked at the 126 ideas from different angles, like, did it meet our strategy, strategy in the broader sense, like the philosophy behind our strategy? Is there a customer need? Does, can the idea create impact? Is it feasible? And the gut feel factor, but also looking at the team. So those were six factors that we used. Um, but um, yeah, so that that's where, how we brought them down. But all the other ideas luckily weren't lost uh, because we have a sustainability program that was eager to pick up a lot of the ideas that were in there, even though they weren't accelerated, they were still looked at from a you know, like sustainability perspective. Uh, and Renee, maybe you can talk a little bit about the bootcamp itself. Yeah, of course, Derek. I mean, the, the bootcamp itself is a is a eight week acceleration process, basically going from the problem definition to the business model uh, design to uh, the 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 business roadmap, the MRP strategy, and in the end, the investment ask ending in a dragon's den. But I, I think I I wanted to highlight two important things. One is that uh, we forced the teams to go out and test their ideas with customers as soon as possible. You know, just to stress test their, the critical assumptions behind those. And we call that get out of the building weeks because, you know, uh, the idea is basically you cannot really learn from just sitting inside the building. You need to get out. That's where reality hits you, right? Um, so that's an important thing. The other part is that um, we, we specifically asked the teams to dream big but start small. Um, so the question was basically how might we actually create a revolutionary dream and then at the same time, start to think about how to execute it in evolutionary steps. So those were uh, two important things during the bootcamp. So it's, is it my understanding that uh, one of the final outcomes of the bootcamp is the pitch video? Okay. Absolutely, so, yes. <laughs> okay, great. That's the, so the I think we, point, yes. Okay, so um, I think we are going to watch Roger's pitch video that came out of the bootcamp right now. I'm happy to present our proposal, Remote Factor Acceptance Testing. We can save 544 sales dates, 1.3 million in travel costs, 2,700 tons of greenhouse gases with our remote FAT solution. We think it will take roughly six months to perfect the execution and solution. This will include user experience study, scaling out to Westboro, Testa Center and sales engagement. For this, we need roughly 200K and 2.5 FD. Wow, that's impressive, Roger. That's great. Um, so what was it like for you to participate in the boot camp? Oh, that was a great learning experience, both from process perspective, but also completely remotely. And we did it across three different sites and during uh, different time zones. And the short time focused us to become a, a tight team that worked together, that trusted each other, and we felt very early, really empowered and committed. We are going to deliver on this. And uh, typical weeks where we had two half days of well-defined work was Tuesday, Wednesday. And then we prepared the pitch 
for Thursday Eve for the other five teams, the coaches and the senior leaders, where they could ask us question, have you considered this? If you why then shrinking your idea of your view, how will it look then? So it was very good exercises. Uh, and as Rene said, one of the sessions was go out and test your assumptions, your ID early with the customer, which we did. It felt uncomfortable to go there with a rough ID, but it was very good because then we get true fact on what the customer considered to be important for them in our case. So we have another level of confidence when we move forward because then we know this is facts. This is not my personal perception on what will be important for the customer. Another uh, session was that we was considered that, okay, what are the risks you have in your project? Are there unknowns? How do you identify them? How do you start to mitigate them so you can navigate and see, will you be able to reach your goal or not? And therefore, we had to reach out to other people in the organization that helped us with that. And the benefit with that is that we now had built up a network that helped us when we started to do the implementation of the ID broader. So that was uh, some very key sessions that we did. Oh, great. It sounds so fascinating <laughs> and interesting and intense. Um, I would like to follow up with Maria and talk about, I know you touched a little bit on this earlier, but what are the elements, so from Roger's team or other teams, what are the, the key things that made you say, yes, we're gonna invest in this? For me, uh, two. Uh, the first one is, are we trying and working to solve, you know, uh, industry or business challenge that hasn't been tackled before. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, would this get us closer uh, and able to reach one of our strategic goals? So if I, what, what, if I was able to answer yes to those two questions, for me, it was a clear view, we must invest in this. Great. And so what advice would you give to another company who wants to start this type of initiative? My first advice is understand the problem you're working to solve. So you, you have to start uh, with understanding what's that problem you're trying to solve. The second one is have freedom, freedom to explore. Um, take the time, as I said, to, you know, the best thinking happen when you're not thinking uh, and foster that cross-cultural collaboration. Um, you know, I do think uh, the Saitiva culture is one that has allowed us to do this. And, and I think it's part of the secret sauce of the company. It's making it better every day, but it's listening to those that are hand on hand working, solving for these problems that are closest to the customer, that are closest to the technology. Great, thank you. Um, and I'd love to hear from Roger now. Um, now that you've received the funding, um, mm -hmm. I would love to know what happens next for the Team Dreamstream, which is quite the <laughs> yeah. quite the tongue twister. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. But That's okay. you know, we have used the funding to scale up. So now we have this type of TV studio equipment on all our major sites, so we can could conduct remote FATs, demos, and trainings. Last year, we did 125 remote demos and FATs, resulting in that we saved roughly 3,000 tons of carbon dioxide. That's equal to roughly 200 hectares of growing forest that needs a year to accumulate that amount of greenhouse gas. And furthermore, we helped our sales colleagues to save 500 days from less travel. The forecast for this year will be that we will save another 5,000 tons of greenhouse gases, equal 320 hectares of forest, and almost 800 travel days that our colleagues in sales could use in other way, interact with a customer, help them with solutions, so forth. And we also see that this equipment could help us with internal, external events as well. And also see that with this type of technology, 
we could have more participants in the meetings, giving a better dialogue and improve the quality. So I think it's it's many benefits. Wow. From a non-scientist perspective, I'm going to say that's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. That's very impressive. Um, that's wonderful. So I'd love to hear next um, from Dirk about what is next for Innovation Accelerator? Yeah, so, um, I mean, obviously the Planet business worked really well for us, right? It worked for 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 the outcome. We had Roja right now. We have another five projects that we couldn't talk about here today, but it just made this tremendous outcome uh, for sustainability for the business, but also the learning journey that we took people through, uh, the feedback, like from Maria said it, uh, Roja said it, the, the growth that we have seen from the people participating has been amazing and humbling really uh, it's great to see that so uh, definitely we're we're doing it again uh, so we started an initiative this year uh, called game changer so we wanted to take all the learnings that we had from um, in this in this COVID year right where where the game was really changed on us we wanted to take that forward and make sure that we don't miss a skip a beat here and really take the key learnings forward and um, accelerate those ideas that came with it Great. Um, so where are you in that process? Yeah, we're actually, <laughs> we are actually just at the time where Roger was a year ago um, when he prepared his pitch video. So the pitch videos were just finalized today. Uh, and uh, next week we will have our event where Maria and Emmanuel and uh, two others actually what we call the dragons, they will be talking about uh, looking at the videos and make their final decision. Um, we have three internal, but also one ex formerly external person there on the panel. So it's going to be super exciting. Oh, that is exciting. I can't wait uh, for the next one as well. Um, <laughs> but we are we are certainly looking forward to learning that. And obviously, we'll have to wait uh, for another broadcast when that is ready. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much to everybody, my the four panelists uh, who presented today. And I appreciate everyone joining online. I hope you got something out of this. Um, and just please stay tuned for updates regarding our next live broadcast where we'll be discussing Cytiva's Exozone Challenge. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Thanks,